So um, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'd like to welcome you to, I'd like to, this evening I'd like to introduce Frank Trazo. Frank is a local Napa artist whose works are inspired by nature, archetypes, and metaphors. He is originally from Washington, D.C. area. He started drawing and painting when he was quite young and continues drawing and painting to this day. He has won many awards for his work and is looking forward to sharing his story with you. Frank will be exhibiting his work in the library through the month of March. Please drop in and see his beautiful work in person. After tonight's presentation, we'll be opening up a Q&A with Frank. We ask that you type your questions using the chat button at the bottom of the screen. You can enter your questions at any time during the presentation. We will have them, we will save them till the end. And with that, I am happy to welcome Frank Trazo. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, friends and family. I'm Frank Trazo and welcome to the virtual art reception that's from the gallery, from the uh, library. I wanna thank you all for joining me tonight and I would love to see you all in person, but I'm glad that you can make it. It's an honor for me to be here. Uh, usually when we meet at the library, we have wine and cheese, but so I hope you all have brought along a glass of your favorite wine or the beverage of your choice. I'm planning, what I'm planning to do tonight is talk about my ideas, my inspirations, my methods of work, and also about the paintings that are in the show. So sit back and we'll get this started. So, First, a little bit about me. I was born in Washington, DC, and I grew up in the area, and I went to school in that area. But I started drawing and painting when I was young. And as a child, I would sit and draw for hours when I wasn't making models. And even in classes, I would doodle and draw constantly. And my parents recognized my interest in that, and they sent me to art lessons throughout my early life. I got my first set of oil paints when I was nine and started painting with oils then. I still have some of those in storage somewhere. They're not great, but what are you gonna do? Um, so I continued making art through high school and became very serious about it when I went to college. I had a great teacher, a great painting teacher. And so I majored in the art classes and I ended up with a degree in education so that I could teach art if sometime if I wanted to do that. But um, I was always, I was not encouraged to be an artist. I was encouraged to do something else my entire life and to make money or to make a living. And so it's difficult to make a living through art. So let's uh, go on to the next slide, which is after college, I worked on a master's degree in sculpture, which I never completed because I became interested in jewelry. And sculpture and jewelry have similar processes. So I started making jewelry and I was able to sell all the jewelry I made and the sculptures would just sit on the shelf. So I moved to California in 1976 and I found work in the jewelry business with the help of a friend and mentor named Alan Revere. And this led me to study goldsmithing and design in Germany, Southern Germany. And I opened up jewelry businesses when I came back. During the 90s, I got into computers and eventually opened a business producing multimedia, web design for tech companies and startups, and closing off the jewelry part of my life. That was a really successful business and that led me into real estate and I became a real estate broker. I was buying and selling houses and fixing and flipping houses uh, in Napa, uh, which also was a good business, but I always longed to get back to my art and finally in 2014, I was able to do that full time. On the left or on the screen, you'll see uh, some one of my rings and a pendant that I made back then. Both, uh, both are gold and uh, diamonds and rubies, crystal, enamel, pearls, and things like that. And I did a lot of jewelry. So my thoughts on art. I, um, art is what makes us human. It affects our emotions and it connects us to one another and to our history. It also connects us with the divine. No other animal on the planet really makes artworks or has any use for them. If you give a, a monkey a choice between a paintbrush and a banana, he's always gonna go for the banana. 
I don't think he's going to take the paintbrush and go out and find a canvas. So I paint a lot of different things, a variety of subjects. I love to explore and paint whatever captures my interest. I mostly work with symbols and some of my images are derived from dreams and meditations. I'm a fan of Carl Jung and I've read a lot of his books when I was younger and in college. And so I tap into the subconscious through meditation and I try to do that on a daily basis. Some of my paintings there on the screen. So I'm inspired by physical nature around us as well as our inner nature, symbols, myths, archetypes, all these things intrigue me as well as historical beliefs and spiritual knowledge. I like to merge my images into something that you don't find in reality. So all these little things happen here. This is the parable of the small investor and Sunboat. Sunboat is in the show. So I mainly work in oils and acrylics, and I use several methods of composition. This is more technical for the artists who are watching this. I build my ideas and images from sketches that I do, reference photos, but um, often combine them, compose first in Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, or Procreate on the iPad. And I'll keep working on the idea until I think it's ready to hatch. And then I'll draw the image and put down a layer of burnt sienna over which I add color. And the acrylics, I usually go straight to color and build up layers. And this thin layer is keeps the white out and reduces the, the glare from the canvas and also tones it. So I use traditional methods of transferring and drawing to canvases, uh, grids, transfer paper, proportional dividers. Sometimes I use a projector to scale a drawing or photo up or down. The process is never exact. It evolves and changes as I work and I'm always surprised how it turns out. And although it looks easy, painting is not easy work. You're making hundreds of decisions and struggling to make it look right. Not every painting turns out, uh, but you learn something from each one. And over time you improve. And if it doesn't, you can paint over it or use it to patch holes in your hog fencing like Van Gogh's mother did. So I use two other interesting methods of starting a painting. One is called pareidolia and the other is automatic drawing. And pareidolia is the, the definition, is the tendency to perceive a specific, often meaningful image in a random or ambiguous visual pattern. So it's basically the human ability to see shapes or make pictures out of randomness, like images in the clouds or images in boulders, for example. And the way I do that is I paint a thin wash of burnt sienna again, and I let it dry. And when, the dry, when, when it's dry, the images present themselves. And I'll turn the canvas one way and the next way, and I'll see which image I prefer. And so the dragon on the left there, if you can take a look at it, there's an image off to the right-hand side, for example, that shows a a uh, Neanderthal hunter, and I didn't know whether I was going to paint the dragon or the Neanderthal hunter, and the, the, uh, the dragon got my interest, so I chose that one, that's the preference. And in the winged uh, Icarus painting, also you can see the underpainting that his face is there. So when I painted this, or when I put the coating down, or the first layer down, this is what appeared. And so that's sometimes how I do my paintings. And then automatic drawing. And some of you may have done this before or not tried it yet, but I'll let the pencil move across. First, I'll quiet my mind. And then I'll let the pencil move across the paper and I'll connect the lines and then I'll develop what I see. When I get stuck, I'll use either intuition or meditation to see what I'm supposed to be doing. And sometimes I'll leave it for a day or two. And uh, so basically I try to let it flow out of the pencil and it's fun to see what it becomes. Of course, I have to erase and revise along the way, but then I'll use these sketches in my paintings. So the one on the left there is robot lipstick. The other one with the knight is fear of intimacy. And the third one, which became a painting is higher self. And I, I really enjoy doing that. I keep 
diaries and sketchbooks and I try to draw something every day or paint every day in order to keep it going and also because I just have so many ideas I want to keep putting out and this is fun for me it's a meditation and so I, I like to study other artists too so I have a collection of on the on the computer I have a collection of artists work that inspire me and I go to museums and I go to shows and see what's what's happening. And I, I love the work of all the artists that have come before us and who are still alive with us. So the library show, this is what's hanging right now. If some of you haven't been able to get there or if you're from out of town, out of state. And uh, these are some of the images. And the first part of the presentation of my images it's about my visualizations. And some of these have captions and captions that go with the paintings. The second part is about my wildlife paintings, the animals A to Z series, which are also symbols in themselves. And I've been painting, I've got 17 out of, actually I've got 18 out of 26 done. And still trying to come up with N and X. So those are hard for animals. The third part is a short look at a different style. I, it's a series called The Color of Music, and it's about things that are experienced but can't be seen. Right now, it's mostly about music. So here's the first one, and this is sort of the logo for the show this year or this month, and it's Horse Mandala. And it's one of the, the visualizations. The um, caption that goes with this is rein in your untamed thoughts like steeds and see the light within. So this one is about, mandala means circle in Sanskrit. And this one's about spiritual knowledge and meditation. And the quotation is from the Bhagavad Gita, which is the Hindu scripture that was written 4,000 years ago. And I don't know if it's a direct quote, but it's a quote I found from an indirect source. And I thought this would be perfect for painting. The uh, painting says, the human mind is full of energy and it jumps from thought to thought. Doors open when you learn to listen to your subconscious. So I meditate, like I say, every day and art to me is a form of meditation. Higher self. Um, I believe that all humans are part spirit. Most people have some idea or some belief that there's a soul or something inside us besides our physical nature. And, uh, and I believe that there are seven senses. There's five physical senses, touch, taste, smell, hearing, sight, as well as two spiritual senses. The um, sixth sense is your consciousness and you're able to connect that to others. The, uh, for example, somebody you're thinking about suddenly calls you out of the blue or you haven't seen somebody in a long time and you're thinking about them and suddenly you bump into them in the grocery store. That's kind of the sixth sense and how it works. The seventh sense, however, is the higher self and that's the connection to that divine part of you that's inside you. And that connection is probably just pure light and you can't talk to it directly, but it appears in images. If you read any of the literature about this, it will send images to you that you're supposed to interpret or give you things to, to do. So that's the higher self. And then dare to dream big. This one is four foot by three foot. So it's, these are big paintings and they're at the entrance of the library. Um, when I was younger, I wasn't encouraged to be an artist and um, young artists can have their development stifled by the comments of those around them and it sets them back on their path and so creativity should always be encouraged and uh, even though not everybody's going to like what you do and it's hard for you to sometimes accept that uh, because people are threatened by change and what happens it's a survival mechanism when they see something they don't like or don't know it, it's kind of threatening. So even a song that they hear for the first time, you may not like that song, but over time it has begins to represent something meaningful to you. So I did a meditation on this and what I 
found was, or what I got back, the message I got back was believe in yourself, follow your own heart, do the, do the work, don't let anyone stop you. You'll be frustrated by the struggle, but the energy and the joy you get from the process is beyond measure. You'll make many mistakes along the way, but in the end, you will produce a masterpiece and that masterpiece is you. Dream big. The uh, ones that are on the wall, when you go in, this first one is Sunboat. And this is a reference to quantum mechanics. I, I like the work that's happening now in the quantum fields. And it's confusing to me. I'm not a physicist. But quantum entanglement is the unusual behavior of elementary particles where they become linked so that when something happens to one, the same thing happens to the other, no matter how far apart they are. And I, I don't want to get into um, quantum mechanics at this point, but take a look at that. You see there's two kings there, and each one's rowing against each other or doing the same thing, but opposite. And it also is a reference to pure energy, light, and invisible physical forces. The uh, next one here is Gaia sends her thoughts to untrained eyes. And this one is about global warming. Gaia is the spirit of the earth and the fires, floods, hurricanes, storms, earthquakes, and things like that are warnings about climate change. So that's Gaia. Originally, I thought maybe I would do something that shows that all religions are one, uh, where I'd have a Buddhist menorah or something like that, but then I realized what I was painting. I was painting, painting Gaia. Consciousness creates the world. Um, we bring the world into being by our own creativity and consensus. We create the future. So, so this one's about the sixth sense again, and uh, says, how does one paint the sixth sense or show it? And this is my Attempt. One of the ways, of course, is to use the opening eye, and that's why consciousness. And, and then we create our own world by allowing it to happen, making it happen in conjunction with others. Winging it. Well, winging it, um, the caption that goes with it is, you gain nothing by, oh, sorry, you gain by trying. Gain, nothing is gained by sitting still. You succeed or fail. Either way, you make an impression. And this one, again, was done with uh, the process that I use, pareidolia. And it's Icarus um, trying to make an impression on somebody or making a mistake. Either way, uh, landing in the water. The sun takes the night off. That one's pretty much self-explanatory. It was the original sunboat painting. I did this one in 2015. And uh, it's got people on the shore. Excuse me, D is for dragon. So dragons are a symbol of both good and evil, depending on your culture. This one is releasing sulfur, methane, and CO2 gases into the air. So it represents greed and destruction of the environment. It's not a good dragon. But I like to have something that had bright color and red and black is wonderful together. So this is, uh, this, of course, he's got smoke, uh, something steaming out of his nose. So here's another mandala. This one is the dragonfly mandala. And the dragonflies represent transformation and renewal. It's a symbol of strength, courage, and good luck to different cultures. And this is elephant mandala. I've done a lot of mandalas in the past, but these are the, the, the larger of my mandala series. And I love elephants. When I was a child, I think I was probably two or so, they took me to the zoo and I was able to see an elephant up close and actually touch it and it made this lasting impression on me. And um, it was rough and alive and stately and it became my totem animal throughout my life. And on a trip to Thailand, I was able to ride one 
Tamina, my wife, and I were able to ride one, and they're incredible. In uh, Sri Lanka, I, we took a trip to Sri Lanka too, and there I watched one pull a banana tree right out of the ground and start eating it as it walked along with its body, its trainer. Um, this is again the wildlife series. This is H is for hippo, animals A to Z. And I want to send out a special thanks to my friend John, who's on tonight, for the reference photographs that he took when he was there. And he'll be giving a talk soon about his trip to Antarctica. And I hope everyone who's here will get to enjoy that. So this has dragonflies again and hippos. And I used purple rather than gray. And I used green for the water. And I think it was pretty successful. Um, P is for panda. This is one of my wife's favorite. She won't let me sell it, but pandas are like humans in bear suits. And this one is having lunch. So M is for monkey. This is probably one of the first of the series. When I was a boy, I had a pet monkey who used to ride on my head when I took him around on my bicycle and he'd go everywhere to stores and on vacation and things like that. And the monkey was uh, always amazing, fun. It would always groom me when it was stopped. And that was, uh, Clancy was his name. And we, um, when I went away to college, had him you know, for many years. And when I went away to college, he suddenly became mean and wouldn't let anybody go near him. I couldn't even get near him when I came back. The whole family was kind of scared of him. And so, he got an infection and, and died, unfortunately. And I wish we had given him to a zoo or something before that, but we didn't know. Uh, I didn't have a pet zebra though. I have zebras for zebra. This is the wildlife series. K is for Kestra. This is a sparrow hawk, a little bird of prey, pretty bird of prey. Um, this has meaning to me because one of them actually attacked a pigeon that landed it knocked a pigeon out of the air and landed in the yard. I went out to get my camera and take a picture, but it was frightened, frightened away by, the, uh, by me approaching it and left the pigeon. We tried to revive the pigeon, and I think it did revive, but it lost its lunch. It lost out on lunch. P is for tiger. Um, I went to the San Francisco Zoo and took some pictures, and I tried to paint this as close to life size as I possibly could. The head is huge. But I don't know which tiger it was because they rotate the tigers. Uh, this one's either Titania, Titania, or Tony, and those are the two big tigers that they have at the zoo. And, uh, I put it into an environment. So this is another one of my series. This is called The Color of Music, and the premise is what would music look like if you could see it? And so I have butterflies coming out of a violin, and I have birds circling in a heart above the piano. And so the first one's called cadenza, and it's what a cadenza is. It's a virtuoso, virtuoso solo passage inserted into a movement in a concerto or other work, typically near the end. That's its definition of where the uh, the, the uh, soloist can show off their skills and their, their artistry. A sonata is a composition for instrumental soloist, typically in several movements in sonata form. But so this is place playing a love song. The uh, another two that are hanging on the wall on the other side, uh, Allegro is a passage or movement in a brisk tempo. And uh, cello she's playing the cello and a cello sounded to me like dragonflies so i put dragonflies playing that i've done several others too but they're sold um, but an aria this one is an aria is a long accompanied solo song for solo voice um, typically in an operetta operetta opera or oratorio and this is a picture of my daughter who's a singer and she's singing uh, and Cherubs are coming out of her mouth. 
another wildlife series. B is for bear. And V is for vervet, which is an uh, African monkey. These are hanging in the back wall. And I had one more, but I couldn't find it. So I put in this one, which is Sphinx's texting. And originally, this was uh, a picture of two people who were not talking to one another. And I did it in 1989 and changed it over the years. It evolved into Sphinxes in 2014. And then uh, I added the cell phones in 2017. I think I want to add those into some other paintings at some point. Picture of me kind of looked like that. Self-portrait in the time of COVID. It was a very, very dark time for everyone, a time of suffering. We're still kind of going through it, but it looks like it's getting lighter out there. On the wall behind the copy machine, there's two paintings. One is called E is for Elephant. And this was in the museum, I'm sorry, it was in the um, library a few years ago. It had one painting of the month from the Art Association. And uh, it's a pretty big painting, it's 30 by 40. And this one was in last year. A number of you may have seen it already. It's called Mind Palace. And Mind Palace, if you remember, is a way for people to remember information. In the past, knowledge was transmitted from generation to generation by word of mouth, and nothing was written down. People had to memorize all of the words to songs, or even Homer's Iliad and Odyssey were memorized for, for 400 years before they started to write them down. So they developed a method to, to do that. And the method was called a mind palace or a mind house or whatever. Um, so it's you associate rooms and symbols with what they needed to recall, so they could go through the whole poem cycle and and not skip a beat or miss a word. And uh, this method has been taught since ancient times. And Sherlock Holmes talks about it in his books that he had a mind palace where he stored his information. Each of these is a representation of something. And if you can see it up close, there's a dragonfly, there's a tree, there's a, a disc, there's elephants, a child, a lion, an idol, a moon figure, and an owl, along with the drummer who is representing the ego, the person, the, yourself. The elephants are memories and the Drummer, of course, is the self. The disc to me is ancient knowledge. It came from a carving on a boulder in a city, a destroyed city in, in Sri Lanka. Well, it wasn't destroyed, but an ancient city that wasn't there anymore. So there's more on there. There's, the sun is the soul or the human spirit. Uh, the owl is wisdom. And the crows, if you can see them, are fleeting thoughts. And there's fish in the river. The river represents the unconscious. So before I drift to a close, I just want to say you've been a, a great audience and thank you again. And I want to say to all the creative people, especially the young ones, artists change the world. If you're drawn to art, experience it, cherish it, enjoy it. It brings a sense of peace through its creation and its observation. It allows us to see things from a different perspective. So believe in yourself. We only get good by dedicated practice. Keep progressing and keep doing the work until it flows from you. Let your voice be heard. Don't listen to negative people. And you will find happiness. You'll find your voice and you'll see what your soul is made of. So I wanna thank a few people. First of all, I wanna thank everyone for spending some time with me. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I hope you get a chance to see the show at the library. And you can also see some of my work at the Art Association on first, the gallery on First Street and some at the Jessel Gallery and on the web at my, my website, frank, www.frankdrosser.com. In addition, I want to tell you that there's some shows coming up. Uh, there's a pop-up show we're going to be having with the Art Association on May 1st and and we're planning to hold open studios again this year. So keep uh, those dates open. Open studios are the last 
two weekends in September, and we'll post updates as it becomes available. If you like this and you want to be on my mailing list for upcoming shows, please write down the email, send an email to me and at the address on the screen, and I will thank you for that. And I, I also want to thank a few people here. First of all, I want to thank my wife, Rowena, for making it possible for me to do my art and uh, sharing our lives. Thank you. I'd like to thank Rosemary Kimpton again for the article she wrote in the Napa Register. And I want to thank Fuji Rivera, who's on the screen there, Stefana Prema, and Helene Crane for helping put this presentation live online. Uh, I think it will be, it is recorded and will be available to watch again at the Napa County Library YouTube channel. And I think uh, Fuji can tell you what that's going to be. Can you tell them what that is going to be? That yes. Helene? Of course. Um, so thank you again, Frank. You had a wonderful presentation and it was lovely. Um, I really do love your work, especially the animals, because I am an animal lover. So of course. Um, and yes, we are recording this program. So we uh, it's going to be edited and then sh next week should be posted onto our YouTube. Um, and then, yeah, but let's go ahead and jump into Q&A. Um, okay. So and we do have our first question here by and I really, um, in advance, uh, apologize if I butcher anyone's name, uh, Bill Melberg. Uh, and he says, do you make an effort to use the golden rule of proportion and geometric ratios in your work? Or is absolutely. it your eye or location and subject? Yes, absolutely. I use the, the, I'll use rules of thirds too. So I'll divide the canvas before I start into thirds. So one third one third, one third vertically, one third, one third horizontally. And where those lines meet is where I will place the eye of the animal or the, uh, the important part of the painting. I uh, did remember you saying something also with using um, a monitor, is that correct? Do you I use, switch? I use a projector to like the, um, the higher self was a drawing that was three inches square. And so I wanted to put that and make it three feet on a three foot canvas. Wow. So in order to do that, I had to use a projector to, to blow up the drawing and that's how that came through. Oh, nice. Okay, so the next question is, have you considered, oh, this is from Helene, have you considered creating a children's book with the an, with animal series? They are beautiful. Thank you, thank you, Helene. Yes, I'm working on it. I still have a few more to go and then we'll see what happens. I've got some other ideas to do with that too. But uh, I'll let I'll let everybody know when I get that done. Going, yeah. Uh, a question from Kathy Long. Cousin Eric wants to know if you use the um, xenomorph for the letter X animal. Hmm, that's a good one, Kathy. Thank you for that. I'll look into it. I'll look into it. I don't know. Let's see. Carol says, wow, fantastic presentation. Love your perspective and your images. Thank you. Thank you very much. Linda Feud says, thanks for your presentation. Very interesting. Great. Thank you. And Carol, uh, Carolyn, do you have a favorite image, image or series? That's like, who's my favorite artist? You know, I don't have, uh, there's thousands of artists in it. So I have no favorite image. Um, I, my next one is, is the one that I like the best. <laughs> S. Gerwin, thank you for a wonderful pre uh, presentation, Frank. Your work is very colorful. You can talk a little about how your, uh, can you talk a little bit about how you select your colors for your artwork? My colors are pretty saturated. I don't tone them down. However, on certain paintings, I will, um, for example, the dragonfly mandala, I added a little bit of green to every single color so that they would all blend in because green and purple and all these things didn't work out. So I'll, I'll touch, I'll, I'll tone them down a little bit, but I do like to use saturated colors. Like the dragon is black and red and that's as red as, you know, cadmium red is as red as you can get. And, um, but I, I do try to balance the colors when I'm working with them. I'll find things, I'll try different colors together and see if they clash or if they, they work together so that they are har harmonic, they're harmonic. 
Uh, from Ed, I love Frank's work and I'm proud to say he's a lifelong friend and inspiration. Well, thank you, Ed. I think Ed is my friend from that, that I've known the long, one of the, my oldest friends, if it's the same Ed, and uh, he's a pilot. And uh, we go flying together sometimes. But the, um, known him since second grade. Oh, wow. That's a long time. That's a true friend. Yeah. From John Kaminsky, I understand a lot more about your work now. Great presentation. Thank you, John. Uh, from Wendy Denton, I really like your work. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to see, to see your presentation. Thank you, Wendy. From uh, Bill Melberg, do you like working big rather than on usual canvases? On, on small canvases, sorry. I, I do both. I like working big, they take longer. I like working big better because it leaves more of an impression when you get up to a big canvas. It kind of envelops you, whereas a little one, you do a pretty picture of something, an animal or a flower or something like that. And it's nice and you can hang it on the wall, but it doesn't have the same impression of having something large. If you go to the museum, you'll see a lot of larger paintings and those are just enveloping and that pulls you right into the, into the painting. Uh, from Carolyn, I especially like the spiritual perspective. Thank you, Carolyn. I know that you are also a spiritual artist. And, uh, nice to know. Thank you. So we're just waiting for more questions. Uh, remember the chat and Q&A buttons are on the bottom of your screen. Um, I do have a few questions myself. Do you ever do prints of your work or is it just like you just do originals? No, I have lots of prints. I, I make, in fact, I sell more prints than I do originals. And I have prints of just about everything except the last few paintings that I've done. And uh, I sell them at my shows and I have them in the galleries. And, uh, and yes, I'm happy to let you see some at some point and provide them. Do you, um, is it difficult or is there a difference between the prints and your original? Is the quality still? No, they're called giclés and they are super high quality. I think it's French word for spray and it basically looks exactly like the same thing, but smaller. In fact, you can actually print a giclé the same as the painting and the difference oh, wow. is really hard to tell. The only way that you can tell is if there's some paint that's sticking up or a little bit thicker in some areas, but you can't tell the difference. Oh, from Ed, what is your printing process? I use, I, actually, I, I go through a company called Berkeley Giclet, and there's another company called, uh, not Bay Photo, one, there's another company that I use once in a while through my website, and they'll print, and those are also Giclets. Now, you're talking about printing, like in etchings and in engravings and things like that. I have not done a lot of that. I did that when I was in college and I did that early on. I did some engrave, I learned to engrave when I was in Germany. So I, but I learned to engrave mostly jewelry, but I did some paintings, not paintings, but engravings when I came back. And I like the process. And I was thinking about that today, as a matter of fact, that it'd be fun to do some black and whites because I'm mostly doing some drawings right now, just working on some ideas. Would you say that, uh, uh... Do you prefer either making jewelry or painting or do you switch off or do you still do jewelry? Um, I don't really do jewelry anymore. Once in, a, once in a great while, I'll get an urge to do some jewelry, but I really need to have a good place to make jewelry because if you drop a diamond on the floor in the garage and it falls in a crack or something like that, you're, you're not going to find it. So yeah. I need to have a really good quality studio for that, which I had at one point, but now I still have the equipment. And there's a snow telling when I'll get back into it. And I have always got <laughs> ideas for that. Yeah. From uh, Diane Slade, thank you. Your presentation was very inspiring. Do you have any ideas about how COVID might influence your paintings? Well, just that one painting when I was feeling kind of down about the whole situation, you couldn't go outside, you had to wear a mask. And even if you went outside with a mask, you could still catch COVID. And I felt really... Um, stuck let's put it that way and I didn't paint for a long time I, I, and then I realized that the show was coming up 
I started to get motivated again, plus things started to change. But it was really a dark time here. Everybody was suffering. Everybody couldn't touch one another. You couldn't go out and be with one another. It was pretty horrible. So yeah, it did affect me in that way. However, because I'm an artist, I can, and I, because I meditate, I can just let that go roll off my back and just get back into the work and discover and, and develop new new things and new new methods, new ways of doing things. And uh, so, yeah, it affected me, but affected everybody. Yeah. Uh, it's from uh, St uh, Stefana Premick. Stunning work. Thank you for an engaging program. Thank you, Stefana. Thank you. Uh, from Linda Pollard, wonderful presentation. Lucky to have watched it. Thanks, your sister-in-law, Linda. Yes, thank you, Aunt Linda. Lovely to see you, or lovely to have you here. So we're still waiting for a couple more questions. So I, you did mention earlier that you use Procreate. Do you, yes. are, do you have any finished work on Procreate or are, is it just for like a design and starter process? Um, so what I do with that is I'll take a picture of my paintings in progress. And if I'm kind of stumped onto how to do a hand, for example, where to, where to place a hand or where to, what to put in the sky, or what the clouds are going to look like. So I'll draw them in with Procreate. I don't have any, uh, I do have some digital work, but I don't really promote it. Maybe once at some point, it's, it's easier in some ways to do digital work because it's quick and you can make prints and cards from it. But um, Procreate I use to help me develop the painting. So like, well, it's, it's, it's hard to explain, but it's by adding layers, you can add different things to it. So for example, the Gaia's hair was not there at first and I wanted to know, it didn't look right. And I needed to know what to do. So I used fire to, to make it look like there was hair. Uh, yeah one example. Um, the, the dragon, I actually, from the original dragon, it had a shorter snout that didn't quite look right. It had teeth and, uh, and a tongue. It didn't look right. So I used Procreate to draw on it. And then I was able to take a, a piece of uh, mylar, clear, clear mylar, and sort of draw on that with a with a pen, with a mm -hmm. permanent ink pen, and so I could figure out exactly how it looked on the Procreate page first, and then I could make something that I could use it to trace around. That's how the, the dragon got a bigger snout. Does it take you relatively long to create your? Um, well, I, I would imagine the larger pieces take a long time. But what would you say is uh, lengthwise? They, they usually, Time. They're usually it, it takes a week to 10 days to make the painting all colored and everything in, but then it takes another week or two to put in all the fine detail. And because you're doing this along the way, you find that you change things and then something changes, something else changes and it develops and it's, it's a surprise, but they've been successful. So it takes about three weeks for the large paintings and it takes just a a week or so for the smaller ones. From uh, Joan uh, Carr, I, I believe that's her oh, last oh, name. Oh, Love the presentation and your work. The work shows your knowledge and mythology and religion, as well as your finely developed technique. Thank you very much, Joan. Nice to hear from you. Well, if there's no other burning questions, if you do have a final question, please put it in the chat or Q&A. Um, but I think other than that, that was, uh, again, Frank, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, you have a lovely work. I really admire you, admire you as an artist. Um, you. Do you have any final words before I close? Um, I think I've said enough and I think people want to get to dinner. Yeah. So, um, of course. Well, thank thanks again. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Again. you. Uh, thank you again, and we also want to thank the Library Foundation for everything they do for the library and the uh, Art in the Library program. Please stay tuned next month where we will be having, um, on April 9th, 
uh, Friday, April 9th, John S Sensenbog. He creates intricate scenes using scroll saw and a variety of wood. So you don't want to miss that one. And then also, if you have nothing else to do on March, let me just double check the date. It is March 18th, our virtual Remarkable Journeys while watching in Baja, California. Please uh, stay tuned for that. And again, as I had mentioned, we will be editing this video and uploading it on YouTube. So please uh, look out for that. And thank you again, everyone. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us tonight. Uh, there have probably been a variety of other things on Netflix you could have watched, but we really appreciate yeah. you uh, coming and spending time with us. And thank you again, Frank. Thank you. Thank you all at the library for, for helping put this on. It's great. You did a great job.